Okay, welcome again for the restoration seminar. Thanks for coming in this actually afternoon that I don't think is good for anything but come to a seminar. <laughs> so thanks again. And uh, today I am really just uh, delighted to have uh, our colleague or our former colleague, uh, very Ret nice. retired colleague. I think we actually can call Bill forever a colleague uh, from the biology department. And he has actually talents that I. <laughs> I kind of knew about it, but I don't think many people knew about it. Uh, I bet you knew about uh, what actually Bill taught here at Montana Tech, but this is something uh, I think nobody really expected from Bill unless they, they knew your history. Uh, so before Bill starts his presentation, um, I would like to just read kind of an official few words for the students to get familiar who Bill really is, and then uh, he will start his presentation. So Bill Good has a BS from Linfield College, Oregon, and a PhD in Zoology and Physiology from the University of Wyoming. He had several employment steps before arriving to Montana Tech, including MSU Western Agriculture Research Center, Corvallis, Montana, uh, where he worked on the biological control of weeds, mostly spotted knapweed. And this is the research, basically, uh, he's going to present us. And knapweed is still a big problem in Montana, but I bet Bill has seen much worse times with knapweed because he was there before the biocontrols were released, and he can tell all the stories about it. So thanks for accepting the invitation. Okay, thank you for that nice introduction. <coughs> Uh, let's see, <clears throat> one of my previous lives. I, I spent uh, 14 years here and I spent 14 years at uh, the Western Ag Research Center in Corvallis, Montana. Um, and my <coughs> uh, spotted career, <laughs> rocky career after getting my PhD, it was a tough time to find jobs and not everybody found appropriate jobs and I rattled around in academia a little bit. Um, and temporary jobs and ended up doing whatever, painting houses and um, tying trout flies and stuff like that. I had a, so you go to the um, uh, job service and you fill out the little card and then one day I got a call from the job service over in Hamilton saying, well, there is a job, uh, you may be uh, overqualified for this, but you know, it's a summer job. and." at the ag station working on uh, insects having to do with weeds and why don't you go out there and see if they'll hire you. And so I ended up starting as, you know, just a um, <coughs> field person, temporary field person. Uh, the, the way that was set up was uh, one faculty person was doing bio, bio control of weeds and he had um, uh, one staff person full time with him that eventually worked into two staff persons full time plus uh, temporary people as many as four. So it was a pretty good effort uh, eventually. Um, I um, <clears throat> got to do everything starting at the bottom, at the very bottom, out in the field uh, uh, learned a lot about uh, spotted knapweed and, and about the insects. Um, and uh, <laughs> eventually got to the place where I, I just had to leave to find another job. And uh, uh, was very lucky to find a place here at Montana Tech. Um, that's the short version. Okay. Um, biological controls. Um, this is an interesting uh, concept and uh, back then, it was probably more in prominence than it is now. It hasn't been as active as it was. I haven't been active in this area since I came to Montana Tech, so that's uh, uh, 15 years ago, something like that. Uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about here is published research, and a lot of it isn't. And that's kind of the way that works. Not everything that you do gets published. And um, uh, for various reasons, sometimes the, you just can't find enough stuff, but it's still, you get information that's, that's helpful and uh, helps you move forward, and uh, so I'll show you some of that. Um, <coughs> let's see. The idea of biological control is to 
uh, find insects, in this case, uh, that will feed on uh, a noxious weed that uh, uh, evolved in the natural range, in the native range of that plant. For, Monta for um, uh, spotted knapweed, that would be um, southern central Europe into Russia, I believe. We didn't get to work in Russia at the time. It was still hard times with Russia back then, so we didn't really, we could have done some good things in Russia and, and didn't. Um, people in Europe did that work. They did the search for uh, insects that were feeding on knapweed, uh, but you, you had to select those that uh, were um, as host specific as you could get. Um, insects that were eating uh, primarily knapweed, the ones that came were probably a, a few that were just eating knapweed and, and several that were eating any of the uh, centaurias, the related knapweeds that were noxious weeds in the U.S. And there was a half a dozen of those that are still around. Uh, centaurias, I, I understand, is a big genus and they're huge. Huge, yes, we all know huge now. Um, a big genus and uh, there's about six in, um, in the U.S. Uh, including uh, garden varieties and, uh, and some others. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, so that search and testing is, has to be done over there. You can't bring them over here because they might, might escape. And uh, very good scientist in, um, in Europe did that. Uh, CIBC, is that the right acronym? Yeah, CABI. CABI? Yeah, okay. Oh, C-A-B-I, okay. We worked with, the people we worked with were in Switzerland, I believe, and uh, they would come over every once in a while and check in with us and uh, to find some more things to do, but uh, there would come a time when finally they had one to send us, and the way that's done is um, they uh, get it all approved. The U.S. and the Canada were working together to fund these studies, and um, uh, and then the insects will be sent to a quarantine facility. Eventually, Montana developed its own quarantine facility, and that's in Bozeman, but that didn't happen for a few years. Uh, this could be um, uh, problematic. You get the material, whether it's, um, you know, uh, usually larva or pupa, uh, the insects, and you send them to the quarantine, and the quarantine, they want them to hatch out and see the adults, and then they send the adults they can identify all the adults and send them on. The uh, thing with insects is that um, you go out in the field and you, you collect a lot of larva or a lot of pupa of a species and you bring it into the lab and you rear it and not everything that comes out of there is the species you started out with. This is because of uh, parasites and even hyperparasites. You get, uh, oh, they're <coughs> And both Diptera and Hymenoptera that will do this. What they will do is they, they hunt uh, these larvae, uh, paralyze them and lay an egg on them. Uh, there's no refrigeration in, in that world, so you can't keep the food fresh unless you paralyze it so their, their uh, offspring are eating the uh, larva alive. Um, and uh, then there are even hyperparasites that are parasites on the parasites. So uh, you get this material, you take it to the quarantine, and you say, oh, finally you, you get the right stuff, and you put it in a, and then you mail it to the ag station. And uh, by then it's been some time. <clears throat> uh, hopefully they're still viable, and we can, um, uh, we can take them to the field and release them, or, um, release them in a rearing facility. And at Western Ag Research Center, we had a um, greenhouse that we used for some of those, but quite often, we just take them to the field and let them go. And uh, that's how they got started. Um, let's see. Okay, that's, uh, I'll try to make this work here. Here we go. Uh, you probably should start it. 
Oh, it's projection on the computer. You're going to touch. Nicer. Okay, let's. Oh, there we go. Very good. Okay, spotted napweed. Uh, most of you probably know what this is, but just to go through it because um, um, some things are important to understand about the plant. Um, let's see, uh, a short, short-lived perennial weed. Uh, we saw plants that we, we thought were uh, at least 10 years old. Uh, you can, uh, on plants that, that the roots are in good shape, you can read the growth rings and the woody roots. Um, and of course you can uh, keep plants that long and mark them and, and see how long they live. And uh, we think we, we had plants that were that old. Uh, they, they start out as um, uh, seedling, and let me see if I can um, spot a seedling here. Oh, it's hard. There's a seedling there. There's one there. Um, light, light, yeah, lights are a little bright. If we could get that's oh, good, good. And we can see these a lot better. Thank you. Okay, there's a seedling there. One there. Seedlings have entire leaves. There's a rosette. Rosette will have uh, divided leaves. The rosettes. Maybe that may be the second year, but sometimes in the first year they'll get get to that size. Uh, sometimes the rosettes may take more than two years to uh, to bolt. And um, um, okay, here's a couple of a couple of bolted plants here. This one on the left here is alive. This one on the right has a couple of stems that are alive, but it's is basically a dead plant. Um, and we'll, uh, I'll show you uh, the roots of, of this plant later on. These plants will get um, uh, <clears throat> oh, 10 to 30 centimeters tall. So they'll, they'll you know, they'll, um, they'll, no, I want to say, no, I want to say um, 30, 30 to a meter. 30 to 100 centimeters tall, yeah. So they'll, they'll get up about this this high. I was trying to do inches. Yeah. And um, these plants are, are that tall. Um, <clears throat> uh, branched uh, from the ground and, and the tips of the branches there will be uh, uh, flowers and um, um, <clears throat> these will, uh, as people who get napweed in their yards know, uh, you can mow the napweed and it'll eventually flower from uh, flattened mowed plants on the ground, so they're pretty hardy. And um, um, they're tough plants. They, they really are very, very tough plants. They're, they're amazing. Okay. Oh, I, I'm trying to do... There we go. This is the flower, real pretty flowers. Have pink. Uh, this is a composite and they're, uh, these are... Um, ray flowers here on the side and then disc flowers in the middle. Um, there are bracts on the side, uh, a black edge with little bristles on them here. Uh, this would be the receptacle here and then the stem. Um, they flower, for, uh, the, the bolting uh, of the plant starts to take place in late May into uh, the middle of June. Um, <clears throat> the flowering itself will uh, uh, start right after that. The flowers from, oh, basically the second week of July through, oh, peaking in late July and August and been stretching out into uh, September and October, you can see uh, flowers into December, which is past when there are any pollinators around, so, but, but they do that. <clears throat> and um, anyway, very pretty, very pretty flowers here. Um, <clears throat> after flowering, they, they come down to uh, to this, where the uh, the seeds then are going to develop in inside the seed head, and then the seed head will eventually open. And um, 
Oh, we need to talk about this guy. Um, Apis mellifera. This is probably the most important insect for spotted knapweed. Um, oh, gee, did I bring all my bring all my stuff here? Can't remember if I brought everything. Rick Douglas is going to recognize one of these. I think. No, I didn't. I didn't bring it. It was a jar of honey. <coughs> okay. Uh, I, I don't have a picture of the jar of honey, sorry. Okay. <coughs> Economics of this particular uh, noxious weed. There's some pluses and minuses. Okay. The pluses are makes excellent honey uh, and it makes uh, there's a lot of flowers because the weed is all over the place in western Montana and uh, there's a small industry and there's some people that uh, sell the honey uh, I bought some honey yesterday over in Stevensville from uh, Buckholtz um, and uh, you can buy all the honey knapweed honey you want um, I I've even seen uh, what I'm sure was knapweed honey sold in, in little tiny bottles in um, gift shops in Alaska. Uh, so it's got to be pretty good stuff. And uh, is it pretty good stuff, Rick? Yeah. 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 Okay. The other thing about it is that uh, because of the time of flowering in uh, uh, late summer and um, the um, uh, beekeepers were pollinating uh, fruit trees in, in California will bring their beehives to the Bitterroot Valley to feed on so they can feed on knapweed. And uh, I have never seen a treatment of the economics of uh, that, that part of uh, knapweed. And um, uh, Undoubtedly, somebody's looked at that, but, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, there is a story, an anecdotal story, that um, at one time early on, uh, a beekeeper admits to taking a whole lot of knapweed seed in an airplane and spreading it up and down the valley from the air and uh, did a really good job, really good job. Got it, got it spread around all over the place, and from then it got, got spread qu quite, quite a bit. So they were taking care of their industry and, and, and doing a good job. Okay, well, anyway. Uh, here we go. Um, Biocontrol insects released on spotted knapweed. This is a, um, a taken right from a, a presentation that was made in uh, 2013, and I don't have her name on here. Uh, I missed this. But uh, that's just the list, and I put it back up here on the, on the board. Let me go through it a, a little bit here. Um, five, nine, uh, 13 species. <clears throat> right now, uh, we can see these and these and maybe these. Minutus may be around, but I can't tell obtuses from minutus. Um, and, and I know they're, they're both around here. These are the only ones I can find anymore. And they're right out here. Uh, early in the summer, when the first flowers are coming out, I can find Lorinus in the flowers. They're taking nectar in the flowers. And Cyphercleonis is out there right now. You find them walking on the sidewalk and they're going across the tiers and the steps and things like that. Um, they're uh, working on roots on the knapweed that, that's, that the that's right. Weevil? That's the root weevil. weevil. Yeah, Cyphocleonis is the root weevil and Lorinus is the flower weevil. Yeah. The rest of these, um, I think they're gone. I haven't seen the others in, in several years. There used to be a, a lot of Agapita around and when I first came to uh, Butte here we, could, we saw Agapita and I know the Douglas has had them in their yard, backyard, and, and I had them in my backyard, but I, I haven't seen them for a couple of years. I think they're just gone. Um, Terelia and um, Keterelia, we released them and I never saw them again. Uh, Agapita, uh, we did a lot with Agapita. Yeah, I'm running out of juice on this thing. 
Terralonchi, Apelicrista, and Mancinaria are probably gone. Uh, Bangasternus fausti and Svenoptera uh, Yugoslavia. I never saw them. <coughs> and, uh, but, ha however, they, of course, were released. Okay. This is um, um, a seed head fly, a golf forming seed head flies, and this is my camera. This is my old camera, sorry. This is a um, Europhora quadrifociata, and then I'm going to, this is a female Europhora affinis. See the uh, long extended abdomen, which is an ovipositive. They uh, deposit eggs in the seed heads and uh, uh, make galls that are in the seed heads. This is, I stole this from the internet yesterday, and this is a female Europhora affinis with that extended abdomen. I don't know what she's sitting on, but it isn't knapweed. So I'm, I'm a little, well anyway, it's a nice picture. And this is the male, male with a short abdomen. Otherwise, uh, all these have uh, pictured wings. So you can tell this group of flies. And they were quite abundant uh, on knapweed when I, I first started to work. And they would make lots of galls and you could find um, seed heads that were probably twice the diameter of normal because there's so many galls in there. And uh, you could find 15, 20 galls inside. <clears throat> that didn't last very long. The trouble with, uh, with the galls is that um, um, the insects spend the time from, uh, from the summer through the fall and winter and the next spring in those galls that are sitting up above the ground. Um, the, the larvae that are in there are uh, cold adapted with uh, special sugars. It's like having candy bars on a stick out there. And, uh, oh my goodness, <coughs> uh, it, it, did, didn't, it didn't go well for them. Let's see what's next here. Oh, this is not a good slide, but shows you, you one where you open up a seed head to look at a gall. Let's see. Oh, here we go. <coughs> this is a little better. This opened up a seed head. Here are, is a gall, there's a gall, and there's uh, uh, a seed. This is an akeen with um, uh, a little spritz of uh, bristles. Uh, I think I used up the, the battery here. I'll try my other one. Yeah, little spritz right there. Um, <coughs> you, you could have uh, 20, 25 seeds or so in a seed head. And um, you can have, um, oh, we got to where we're seeing four or five galls, maybe as many as 10 galls uh, on, um, in these seed heads. OK. Um, chickadees. Who doesn't like chickadees? I mean, they're wonderful little birds, just the, most, the smartest little birds run around in little family groups in, in the winter, about 10 birds. And they figured out this. Uh, these gall flies. And I got to spend uh, part of one winter every two weeks going out to a place in the riparian forest over along the Bitterroot River and watching the chickadees because they were harvesting the, the gall flies. And you can kind of see this here. There's, there's the head, there's the tail, there are the feet grabbing onto a knapweed seed head. There's one wing, there's the other wing. That was that was my camera then. <laughs> this is the best picture I got of them. What they do is they, they hover, grab onto the uh, stem just below the seed head and break it off. And then they'd fly to a protected perch. They couldn't feed on it here because it's too dangerous. There's shrikes and, and uh, uh, sharp shinned hawks everywhere. And uh, they just, so they, they fly to a, a a uh, thorn bush or something and find, find a spot and then uh, peck out the galls. And I don't know if they took the seeds or not. I don't think they did. They're just pecking the larvae out of the galls and then they drop it on the ground. So uh, then go out and get another one. And if you watch them, you can see where the piles of, of uh, seed heads are and then when they're gone, I go pick them all up and then I could tell how many they had worked on. They were just, by the next spring, 
there were, was hardly anything left there. And I think that uh, over a period of a few years in the riparian forest, the chickadees just, um, with a little help from the mice, maybe a lot of help from the mice, um, wiped out those, um, those seed head flies. We, I just haven't seen those seed head flies since a long time ago. Like in, in 20 years, I haven't seen them. There are probably some somewhere, uh, but, uh, but, but they're gone, I think, pretty much. Okay, uh, on the right there is, um, that one wasn't broken off, that was bitten off by a mouse. And uh, uh, undoubtedly paramiscus, because it happened at night. And uh, let's see, Amy's not here. Uh, the, there was um, uh, the paramiscus uh, research where we made little nest boxes for, for the mice, and then you open up the nest box and you find knapweed seeds uh, in there. So they were harvesting the seeds, but uh, uh, we know that in the winter they were doing this, so they were harvesting the larvae as well. And so between the chickadees and the mice, didn't stand the chance. Is that the same larvae that they found that, that deer mice eating in, in, Missoula, in Missoula? Uh, I don't know. Pearson? Uh, Pearson, yeah, Pearson worked on that, yeah. I'm not even sure remember which insect it was, but deer mice were living well, the, they, exclusively on that, that larvae all yeah. the Actually, they're both affinis and um, quadrifociata would have been in those seed heads. So they've been taking both of them, yeah. And um, I know Pearson, was that the name? Uh, w w was saying that um, uh, they weren't eating the seeds. I, I, he'll have to prove that to me. Well, they might not have eaten seeds when the, when the larvae were present, but even uh, that they were mostly yeah, but why else cache the seeds? And uh, uh, you, you have to go through the seeds with a, with a microscope. They open up, okay, they're just like um, tiny little sunflower seeds, okay? You crack a sunflower seed, it breaks right in half. And then when you look at a pile of them, I mean, they look like they're whole until you look at them and there's just half a seed there, so. But in Amy's nest boxes would have, you know, they're just plastic pipe. They'd have napweed seed heads in them that yeah. They were caching them. I don't know if you cash insects, but they might. Be. I suspect they, in, they ate the insects fresh, you know. Didn't have to that. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, okay, uh, this is a, oh, the, the, that uh, black thing there is a dead Metzneria possipunctella. Um, and uh, that was released. <clears throat> That's a, a lepidopteran, and it's a bigger uh, insect. It would uh, uh, be in the seed head below where the galls were, the fly galls were, and below where the seeds were. And what it did was it would mine, and then it would have a way of uh, gluing or uh, chewing on the end and then kind of gluing the end so all the seeds stayed in the head and didn't disperse. Then they would feed on those in the fall. They diapause in the winter, and then they feed on them again in the spring. And uh, um, so this is a, another insect that was overwintering in the seed head. And um, this turned out to be really interesting. Okay, um, at the egg station, we had someone who was studying cold hardiness of, of fruit tree buds. And uh, that was just this, we could use the same technology to look at cold hardiness of the insects. So we used the same stuff and did cold hardiness in Metzneria because we were suspicious. Uh, so let's see, oh, back. Minimum air temperature uh, in the months below, see October through April. Um, we could measure the cold hardiness of the larva. They, they would be in an arc that would go down to the coldest part of the year and then back up in the spring. And we had parts of uh, two years. Minimum air temperatures at the ag station, uh, uh, we took weather records at the ag station. We, of course we planned to have the, the <laughs> no we didn't plan. The second year we did this, 
we accidentally hit, well, it was probably the coldest temperature in uh, 30, 40 years, something like that. And that was here early February in 89. And you can see where the dip went below where the hardiness of the larvae. And so that's probably the event that uh, killed most of the metzenaria. There was some metzenaria larvae that survived uh, because they were underneath the snow. But the ones were sticking above the snow, exposed to the air, uh, all froze. And uh, that was a frozen individual I showed you back there. Oh, there's the, there's the little spike <laughs> right there. Okay, <clears throat> root miners. <clears throat> we finally uh, got a root miner, and it was this pretty little moth. This is Agapita zoogana, and it's a little tartricid moth, and um, uh, very pretty little guys, and so I took lots of pictures of them. Uh, I don't know if they uh, take nectar off, but they, they might. But um, uh, well, what they do is uh, they lay eggs on the leaves when the eggs hatch, why the uh, first instar larvae have to navigate down to the root crown and then start to feed on the sides of the root crown. And they've got to get by the, uh, the ants and the spiders to do that. So it's, uh, you know, they, they don't take real good care of their eggs <clears throat> as opposed to what the, uh, the beetles do. Well, anyway, there's another one. They're just, we, I took a lot of pictures of, of Agapita. And uh, here's one sitting in a petri dish. We did a lot of um, redistribution of these guys, and uh, we would do two things. We would redistribute the adults, and the adults, um, we reared them in cages, oh, uh, cages over plants that had been infested, and uh, we'd go out there every day when the adults were coming out and we'd suck them up in a um, um, vacuum and put them in boxes and give them to uh, people who, was gonna, who, were, who came to the ag station and uh, would take a pile of boxes and, and uh, haul them off someplace. I'm not sure how the money worked out. That was a, I don't know, I, we didn't ask those questions. That was going on somewhere. <laughs> they were supporting our research so, somehow. They found a way to support our research when they, well anyway. That wasn't my part of the business. Oh, I wanted to show you oh, this. <laughs> uh, when Agapita uh, got to us, the, the box, I, I told you how, how long the uh, quarantine period is. So finally we got our, our root mining moth. Um, it came in the mail. I uh, opened up the box and uh, there was one or two moths that were still quivering a little bit. The rest of them were all dead. What do you do? <laughs> and uh, we scratched our heads for about half a day and then we realized, oh, we should look in the box for eggs. And sure enough, the box was full of eggs. They'd, they'd uh, gone through all their breeding and egg laying in the little package that they sent, sent us to and the eggs were viable. So I sp spent a lot of time under the microscope um, uh, clipping little, <clears throat> uh, finding the eggs and uh, sticking little pins through the piece of wood or paper it was sitting on. Uh, entomologists do this all the time. You know, you have a pin, you have a little triangular piece of paper, and then you glue a, a bug on the end of it. So we knew how to do those things. And we spent uh, a lot of time then uh, cutting out these eggs and then you could just pin the egg onto the plant and it would hatch and, and you're in business. And so uh, we, uh, we, could, we could do that. We'd take a little piece of paper like this and, and make a little tent and you'd get a, a mated female and stick her in there and then once a day you'd drop her out into another one and then you'd open this up and uh, spend a lot of time cutting out eggs that were on here. And she would lay in about three days in three days, she'd lay about 150 eggs. And uh, so we sent them to places where they would um, start them that way, just pin the egg onto a plant. And it was a big deal. Uh, one of the um, other ag stations somewhere in Idaho discovered that you could bring in agape to a, a, a lighted sheet at night, do night trapping. And uh, 
they, that worked. They got a lot of agapita. They, they would go into an area and, and just get hundreds of them a, a night. And uh, so it was a big deal. And they were having a, uh, advertising it and having people come to, to pick up the agapita. So <clears throat> our boss decided we ought to try it and see how it worked. And, and we did. And we discovered discovered that nearly every one of the moths that, re, that came to the uh, net were uh, males. And uh, so w we didn't go there. Um, you would have had, uh, once in a while you'd kick up a female that would land on theirs, but probably 98% of the moths that came to the... <laughs> and uh, had a discussion with the boss, well, have you told them that this is what's happening, and he, well, uh, I, sorry, I shouldn't have told that story. Anyway, it didn't happen, I don't think. I don't know if they ever realized what it was they were doing, but uh, we didn't hear about those uh, night trapping things uh, for very much longer. Anyway, somebody told them what, what they're actually doing was depleting the population of males from their area and then shipping them all somewhere else. <laughs> Anyway, uh, oh, here's a, a couple of plants, and sorry, th these are pretty well pixelated here. Uh, a couple of small roots, and I'm going to show you. What we would do, we, uh, under the uh, dissecting microscope, we'd have to peel these roots to find the larvae, and I'm going to take these, okay, these are the same two roots in the same order. Oh, this one turned out a little bit better. You can see there's some work right there, and there's one, two, three spots right there where you can see where the agapita has done some mining right at the surface of the woody part of the root. Um, they probably killed some small plants. Um, the most I ever found was uh, on a root was a, a root that was at the ag station where there was lots of... Uh, uh, moths around there. I mean, they're just since we were raising them, there are moths all over the place. I found one root that was, oh, <clears throat> uh, about as uh, big around as a carrot. You'd, you'd get down, but, but a short carrot about that long, there were 50 larvae on it. And it was, it was still alive, just barely alive. Um, we never, in the field away from the ag station, we never saw plants like that. Uh, so, in the end, it looks like Agapita probably was killing some small plants, and this is probably just released the other small plants, and didn't make a, have a, a big effect. But uh, Agapita uh, got a lot of uh, <clears throat> got a lot of interest, and we spread it around, and, and they're still pretty. They're still pretty little guys, even though I haven't seen one in three or four years. Uh, uh, the Douglases. Anybody seen these little yellow? Have you seen them in the last year? Yes. I feel like I've seen them on our lights in Missoula, out at our house when we leave our porch light on. Okay, so there's oh, still mom. some. Yeah. Okay, in Missoula, and then yours was here in Butte. In my house. In your house, they get in your house. Just a few weeks ago, I found one. You found one. Okay, well that's that's heartening. I'm glad they're still around. <laughs> But uh, anyway, let's. Uh, we uh, learned how to count these guys. This is a, a, a distance sampling is a type of sampling that was developed in Africa for big game. You fly an airplane over and then you uh, measure distances to the rhinoceros from the line of flight, and you uh, make um, uh, judgments about this, and uh, you get. Data like this, only instead of centimeters, it's in uh, whatever, you know. Anyway, you can do the same thing with a measuring wheel, you know, like you measure accident sites and that a measuring wheel, and you push it along, and then you see a moth, and then you measure distance to it, and then, well, anyway, the, the same math works, and, and we did a bunch of that. I don't know if this was ever published or not, but it was one, just an example of the kind of field techniques we, we would do. And uh, so we got a lot out of Agapita, even if we didn't kill a whole lot of napweed. All right. 
<coughs> Lorinus. This is Lorinus obtusus. We finally got some, this is a weevil, and uh, you can tell there's the, there's the mouth right there. When I was taking this picture, you could see the little mouth parts working is uh, sucking nectar out of them. I just took this, this picture about two weeks ago at my house over in Stevensville. And uh, these little guys, <clears throat> you can find them in the first flowers of the summer. They have spent the winter down in the dirt hiding underneath the plants. The difference between these and the other seed head insects, this is a seed head insect, is that they get out of the seed head and down into the dirt. And so they're not sitting there vulnerable to the predators that are working above the, the ground and above the snow. A much better um, strategy for survival. And uh, so the Lorinus has taken over. And I think we have uh, Lorinus obtusus was uh, what was brought to Montana. Lorinus minutus, I think, was released on, might have been um, yellow star thistle or diffuse knapweed. And it did really well, so they brought some here, even though it wasn't supposed to be working on spotted knapweed. But uh, it, it may be here. Anyway, I'm pretty sure this is uh, a Lorinus obtusus. And uh, they spend um, the summer uh, drinking nectar and making babies in this, after spending the winter down in the dirt. Uh, the, I guess the reward for having survived the winter. And um, they have a, otherwise a life cycle that's very much like the Urophora, the other seed head flies. And here's um, some seed heads. You, there was a, they make a much bigger gall and that's the exit hole, and here's another exit hole over here. Uh, you can see the uh, spider webs. There are spiders that build their webs over the top of the plant trying to catch the bugs as they're coming out. And uh, that's what we're, we're looking at here. Anyway, the rhinus is, is very successful and, and is doing all right. And um, they spread on their own. It was pretty much opening up the box, and they, they flew away, and um, they probably populated the Bitterroot Valley in uh, five or six years, something like that. Um, uh, I, I don't know how long it took to get to Butte, but they probably had some help from, uh, from other places. Here's the, here's the queen. <laughs> this is Cyphocleona cicades. And this one's sitting on my finger a couple weeks ago. Uh, <clears throat> these are uh, nice big, um, <clears throat> Root mining weevils, uh, they, um, they're flightless. Uh, an interesting concept. Uh, they, um, <coughs> weevils are very careful about laying their eggs. They spend a lot of time. We raised some of these in the greenhouse for a while and got to know them pretty well. Um, <sighs> It looked like the females on the average are laying about two eggs a day. They go down to the root crown, uh, go one body length down the root, clean off a spot, come back up, turn around, go back in down, lay an egg, then come up, and then go head down and, and then cover it all up, trying to make it look like they weren't ever there. And then they go up on the plant and spend some time up on the top of the plant, and then after a couple hours, they come down and do another one. And they probably do this uh, for a couple of months if the weather allows. So they, they may be laying, oh, maybe 100 eggs over a season uh, if things go well for them. But they've taken really good care of oh, those ones. <sighs> no, I think they're moving from plant to plant. The ones we had in the greenhouse, we just gave them one plant to work on. So, uh, but you know, we're, that, that was special. Um, let's see. Oh, here's, an, here's a, this is in my driveway <laughs> a week ago. Here's one down in the base of the root. There, there were two other um, adults down here, and they, they're not in the photograph, but uh, Anyway, we're right in the season for these guys when the cold weather, wet weather came. And uh, anyway, 
Uh, here, here's what they look like when they're up on the plant. This is a female. I can tell because she's got uh, a, a real full abdomen there. She is, uh, I, I'm assuming that this is one that's done what we saw him do in the greenhouse, which was lay an egg down on the, on the root and go up on the top of the tree. Now I think we understand what's going on. Okay, these are real active. They, they go around and this one is, you know, hanging by its hind legs with the front legs out like this. I, she's got her thumb out, you know. <laughs> she's, uh, it just has to be. She's hitchhiking. The formal term for this is foracy, and um, these are phoretic, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, I've, for, for a long time, I've wanted to do the experiment where you get a herd of sheep, maybe just one sheep, take them out in the field where these guys are, and then um, at the end of the day, count how many um, Cyphocleonis are on the sheep. Okay, so uh, she's waiting for to climb onto a sheep or, or a deer or a goat or a knapweed researcher. We would come home at the end of the day from working in the fields and about an hour later you'd something on your neck. It'd be one of these that had gotten onto your clothing. The same thing. They, they're taking a, a, a ride on you to and you can imagine, so the sheep are eating knapweed. Where are they going to go next? To another knapweed patch. And uh, a perfect way. So actually this, don't worry about the fact that they can't fly. You know, deer do the same thing. They eat knapweed. And that's a problem. They probably get on the deer too. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Here's a larva here. And you're seeing it's excavating into the woody part of the root. And uh, uh, weevil larvae are not very um, active. The agapita, the lepidopteran larvae are real active and they, they have a real long tunnel and they will move around in the tunnel, not these guys. They'll just sit in that one spot and just chew what's around them. And make a, you can see this guy's making a pretty big hole in the root. Uh, I'm gonna show you some results from this plant right here. This looks like a dead plant and um, uh, here's what I found. There's actually three plants, and this is really typical of knapweed. You think you've got one plant there, and you go dig it up, and you've got two or three or four of them, actually, They're growing right next to each other. Here's one um, that, um, uh, oh, this one here, I think, had a couple of bolted, it, it put up a couple of flowers this year, but most of these stems were from last year and were dead. These were all dead. These were dead. Um, this plant has a taproot. These do not. <clears throat> so the uh, Cyphocleonis have destroyed the, the, um, uh, the taproot in, in these two plants um, and are probably on their way to doing it on, on this one as well. Uh, this one I think had, I'm just counting on um, what I can see on these uh, dead plants, and estimating there are probably about six larvae on this, six to eight larvae. This one about a dozen larvae. We could see on this just little part right there. And this one I think had nine larvae, um, or the work from nine larvae there, and see a little close up of what that looks like. This <laughs> okay, you remember what the agapita looked like? with those little bit of scratching on the edge of the root. <laughs> these guys just tear up these roots. Uh, there's an exit hole there and there and there. Um, <clears throat> they, they eat until the, um, the, they're, they're big enough and then they're gonna um, die of pause and then pupate the next spring and then um, after they become adults, they spend a little time as adults down in the root till they're, they get hardened, and then they, they chew their way out of the root. Um, let's see, sorry, I'm, we got down to the last minute. And I'd just say one more thing, which is that um, one of the problems with Agapita was Agapita, uh, <coughs> being a moth, they couldn't chew their way out of the root. Moths are not built like that. They don't have chewing mouth parts. So what they did, they would build a, a silk tunnel to the surface that would be their escape tunnel, 
which is where the, um, the parasites would find them. And uh, we run, r ran into the parasites, these Hymenoptera and probably some Diptera too, uh, many different kinds, find a way to get at those pupa. And uh, not, this is not going on with, uh, with Cyphocleonis. Uh, they're staying down the root and then they chew their way out. So uh, I'm not aware that there are any uh, Hymenoptera that get these guys. Uh, we're about done. There's another, there's another one. Oh dear, there's another one. That's what those roots look like. Oh dear. There's an exit hole, an exit hole, an exit hole, an exit hole. Another one up there. So that one had, yeah, they're doing a really good job. And they're just right over there. <laughs> and uh, so these two, Lorinus and, and Cyphocleonis, are, are doing a pretty good job. Uh, research opportunities, uh, well, you can think of what they are. <coughs> Obviously, there's a cycle going on. It looks like over uh, in the Bitterroot, where in my front yard, in my uh, six acre front yard, we're into the second cycle of boom and bust with, with both um, Forestry. Uh, I'm still waiting for the opportunity to get somebody with a sheep that'll help me do that experiment. Oh, and uh, status of the other insects, you, I'm glad to hear that somebody's seen some Agapita. Uh, there may the other insects may be around somewhere I don't know but not doing very well. Oh, for the future, uh, what things could go wrong? <laughs> this guy was sitting on the side of my house, about uh, six feet away from a Cyphocleonis that was also sitting on the side of my house. I don't know how that interaction worked out. We're starting to see these guys over in the Bitterroot, and uh, I don't know where they came from. Somebody let them go over there. They're, they're, they're apparently doing pretty well in the bitter root. So, praying mantis is, is new. Uh, pardon? They can survive the cold? They've been there for a couple of years. Uh, I've seen them pull some too. Is that right? Do you know anything about how they got there? I think people buy them to protect their gardens. Oh. They find them in low yeah. school when I was okay. in fourth, fifth grade. <clears throat> okay, so you put them in your garden. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Raise on the nap weed, on the root weevils. Anything? Um, oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't get to that. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, birds, <laughs> magpies. Magpies will uh, learn to uh, grab the tops and pull on them, and if they break off, then they can get down at the larva. That'd be for the flower weevil. No, that'd be that's the root weevil. They're breaking off the plant and getting down into the root. Oh, really? You know, yeah. Big plants? Yep, yep. Okay, because I, I released, I'd say I'm down by the vines, I released, oh, well, I got them in Bozeman for Noah. Yeah. Um, probably 10 different packages to 40 acres. Yeah. That's where the most of the nap weed is. Yeah. Uh, about five years ago. And I went out this summer and I could find a few of the flower weevils, but not a one. No. Oh. Not a one. You know, the, the others you can get them, of course, are mice. And uh, any, any birds that are foraging, and we the birds do get them. No yep. seem to think they didn't. The birds didn't like them. Oh, I would uh, beg to differ there. Okay. Uh, at the egg station, when we were rearing these, we had to put uh, netting over our rearing cages to keep the birds out. So the birds will get them. Oh yeah, that was house sparrows, and and then there was the magpies. I've got lots of sparrows and lots of magpies. You probably have mice too. Oh, God, yeah, <laughs> lots of mice. Lots of mice. So. Is it a losing proposition then, or should I keep putting them out? Uh, well, here they're doing fine. Okay. In my front yard in Stevensville, they're doing fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, <laughs> well, I really more of this. I, okay, I, I, think, I think it took 10 years to build up the population to where it would became effective. Well, and this has been five years, but now I didn't find a one of the root weeds but I could go around and see some of the flower ranges that would be on the flowers. Okay, did you dig up a lot of roots? I did not. Okay, good. There's some people who go around and pick up the tops. I won't name any names, but uh, they're over there. Mm -hmm. uh, who, um, we'll see, oh, here's another one. Oh, here's another one. Uh, so you're not doing that? No, I didn't touch anything. Okay. Now, I could go out and dig out a few of the roots and check them and see. Yeah. And I haven't done that. Have you, you, find, you find any dead plants? 
there are some plants that were starting to look feeble, I guess. They didn't, you know, half dead. It'd be worth taking a look. That, that's, yeah. Yeah. And it's real easy to do. Uh, obviously, you saw, saw what it's like. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I got. Uh, any other questions? Some of those things that in my yard, in my previous yard, you know, you have an apple this tall, and you kind of grab the top of it, and they fall over. And you see them the large ones. Yes. And I'm supposed to leave them alone. Uh, <laughs> I still got plenty of them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, first of all, I don't know, that was that the end of the presentation? Because That's the end of the pre presentation, yeah. Like People have abandoned the rooms. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is more questions, more of a mention. Oh, yeah. I'm retired. I've got the rest of my life to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bill, I was, I was surprised that basically there's a lot of by one legion, then they relatively have a short time. What was, again, the, uh, the quarantine time? The, like, basically, the time after you can release them. I don't know what is the, the name of the quarantine time. What was I don't know how long the quarantine takes. Oh, okay. But I, I'm sure it's a time for the immatures to um, mature and become an adult. So you, they would have trouble identifying them until they became adults. And so and we would get adults to release, not the not larvae. Is that you said the, I think it was the the cyclopellus. No, no. The, the Cyclopellus that actually was coming from the star thistle. So it actually has more more than one host. That kind of is strange that they release something like that because they really try to be like one host and then if yep. there is switching something to something that's kind of it could be dangerous. Yep. Yeah. What did you think of that? I thought it was dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you, you know, it, it was a th that happened. I think as as a conversation between two researchers saying, "Oh, this is working so good, you ought to try it on spotted napweed." And then, uh, so, and, and well, I don't know, because that was a time when I about the time that I left, and uh, so I just know that. Uh, um, I'm seeing some small weevils that are look a little smaller than um, obtuses. Yeah. So I, that, those might be my okay, thank Yeah. You. Thank you. you bet. <laughs> thank you. Are oh, you welcome? We can stay for discussion for sure, but I just need some Yeah. Did the uh, agapita. Yeah. Did I see two different moths there? Two different images. You just. One with a brown border on the wing, and the other with a brown border and a circle near the tip of the wing. So that, that's one pattern. They, they all they all kind of look like this. Going back though, I saw a different wing pattern. Uh, okay. Maybe, no. Maybe I was thinking that. This this was in my this? previous camera. Because <laughs> what I saw, it, at length, it was maybe as wide as my thumb. Bright yellow. Oh, that's too big. That's, too, that's a different moth. Bright model. yellow. had the brown border only going around the wing. It, it bordered the wing. It didn't have that loop at the end of the wing. You may be seeing a different insect. Bright yellow. I brought it over to my wife. And I'm like, Look at this. Yeah. Well, these, these guys are about this long. Total, total, total length. Is that right? That, yeah. So... It, it was at length. Oh, at length. Oh, 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 I see. I thought, I thought you were saying so it with. I grabbed it. It, it, didn't, it didn't fly, but it was, it was longer than my finger is wide, but maybe a little bit longer than my thumb is wide. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that, that's probably Agapita. Pretty bright yellow and yep. a, a well-defined brown border, but I don't remember if it had a circle of brown near the tip of the wing. Okay. Like yeah. these images. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, took, took it to my door, blew it off my hand outside. So I Good for you. <laughs> Good for you, yeah. They're be I spent a lot of time on Agapita, so I really like that, that insect. And it, it's a shame to see them decline, you know. But I, I'm sure that, you know, the Cyphicleonis, if they're really <sighs> trashing a root, why? There's, just, uh, there, there's not much, yeah. The, the, they, they may just destroy the agapita there too, but um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think the, the agapita, <laughs> over time, uh, those um, 
as wasps.